seat of the Catholic Church, which itself occupied a central place in the next 1,000 years of history. It's really only comparatively recently, in the last 400 years or so, that Rome has ceased to be a center of power. But for 1,800 of the last 2,300 years of Western history, Rome and Roman civilization have played a central role. The many popular aphorisms associated with Rome, such as, all roads lead to Rome, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, and Rome, the eternal city, reflect the cultural, religious, and historical significance of the city. How did Rome become so powerful? This is a core theme that we will explore and we will start our investigation with an ancient author who was completely obsessed with exactly this question. Over 2,000 years ago, a historian named Polybius wrote, Surely there can be nobody who is either so indifferent or incurious as to have no desire to understand by what means and under what form of government the Romans managed to conquer the entire inhabited world and bring it under their absolute control in a time span of barely 53 years. The basic question that Polybius posed, how and why were the Romans so successful in their conquest of the Mediterranean, is one that has continued to fascinate generation after generation and to provoke lively debate from Polybius' time up until today. This fundamental riddle was, in fact, so compelling to Polybius that he devoted much of his life to writing a 40-volume history of Rome in which he meticulously described Rome's expansion across the Mediterranean and offered his own analysis of what he thought was the principal reason that explained Rome's spectacular success. Later in this lecture, I'll identify what he believed to be the key factor in Rome's triumph. But first, let's look at Polybius and his time in a bit more detail. The first thing to note about Polybius is that despite his obsession with Rome, he himself was not a Roman. He was a Greek from the region of Achaea, and in his own lifetime, Roman legions had rampaged throughout the Greek world, subjugating one state after another, including his own. Polybius was thus a direct victim of Roman imperialism, and he actually spent 16 years in Rome as a kind of hostage for his country. On the other hand, while in Rome, Polybius ended up ingratiating himself with perhaps the most powerful Roman family of the day, and he became a friend, confidant, and mentor to the son of one of Rome's most prominent generals, who himself also became a leading general. Polybius accompanied these Roman warlords on various campaigns in Africa and Spain, and eventually served them in a political role as a sort of liaison official between Greeks and Romans. These experiences granted him an insider's view into the very highest levels of society and power at Rome. When it came to his role as a writer and a recorder of events, his experiences gave him a unique dual outlook on Roman history. He was a Greek, a foreigner, but one who was intimately familiar with Roman society. He suffered and witnessed the effects of Roman imperialism from the perspective of its victims. But he also collaborated with the Romans and took part in Roman conquests from within Rome's innermost circles. Therefore, when assessing Roman imperialism, he was both a true outsider and the ultimate insider. Polybius was born around 200 BC in the city of Megalopolis. His family was well-to-do, his father was a prominent local politician. Over a century earlier, the conquests of the brilliant Macedonian general Alexander the Great had spread Greek culture throughout the Eastern Mediterranean and deep into the Near East. Although Alexander's empire had fragmented upon his death into 
numerous, perpetually warring little kingdoms, the preeminent culture that had been adopted by the ruling classes across all of them, stretching from Egypt to Mesopotamia, was Greek. This cultural dominance no doubt endowed some Greeks with a smug sense of superiority. After all, were they not the creators of such cultural achievements as the architectural perfection of the Parthenon, the sculpted beauty of the Doriferous, the plays of Sophocles, and the philosophy of Plato? This was the Hellenistic world, in which the erudition and ingenuity of Greek culture coupled with the ruthlessness of the Macedonian military machine, seemed to be an unbeatable combination. The Hellenistic cities and empires of the Eastern Mediterranean were wealthy, prosperous, sophisticated, and self-satisfied. And then came the great shock. Onto this complacent scene burst the Romans who swept in from the Western Mediterranean and in little more than a generation toppled all the mighty Hellenistic kingdoms. To many Greeks, the Romans would have seemed uncouth barbarians, utterly lacking in the social and intellectual skills and accomplishments that they themselves prized so highly. This made the scale and speed of the Roman military achievement all the more bitter and inexplicable to them. How could such relative brutes have triumphed, and with such apparent ease, over the talented and powerful Greeks? Yet it was impossible to deny the scope of the Roman military success. Polybius called it an achievement without parallel in human history. It was the urgent need to attempt to explain this vexing mystery that was the driving force behind Polybius writing his history of Rome. Polybius began his narration of Roman history with the year 264 BC. That was the year the Romans initiated their first major war against a power outside of Italy. But by that point, Rome had already conquered the entire Italian peninsula, and had existed as a distinct culture for five centuries. Therefore, I'm going to begin my survey of the growth of Rome much earlier than Polybius did, going back to explore the very beginnings of Roman civilization in order to expose how many of the factors that contributed to Rome's success were present from the start and shaped the development of its culture. We will begin our study with geography. Let's say you were hypothetically planning to establish a city with the intent that it would one day conquer and dominate the entire Mediterranean. You could probably do a lot worse than placing it on the exact site where the city of Rome was actually founded. This location possessed a number of geographic advantages that would serve the Romans well over the course of their ascendancy. The Italian peninsula, which famously resembles a boot, thrust down from the north into the Mediterranean Sea at roughly the sea's midpoint. All maritime traffic between east and west has to funnel into the narrow straits between the toe of Italy and the island of Sicily, or else circle around between Sicily and North Africa. The city of Rome lies about halfway down the peninsula on its western side, along the banks of the Tiber River. Thus, by a gift of geography, Rome conveniently sits at a centralized location within Italy from which it was well suited to eventually expand and dominate the peninsula. Also, Italy itself is in a central position within the Mediterranean basin and is similarly well placed to control the broader region. Two important mountain ranges, which further define the Italian peninsula, played roles in Rome's history. To the north, the Alps lie across the top of the boot and separate Italy from Europe. Although pierced by a few passes, generally they're high and icy, and they constitute a natural wall or barrier, hindering northern expansion. Or if you want to look at it the opposite way, 
helping to protect Italy from northern invasions. The second significant mountain chain is the Apennines. These form the spine of Italy, running the entire length of the peninsula from north to south and dividing it in two. When we zoom in on the specific position of Rome within Italy, we find the city is situated not at the mouth of the Tiber River, but about 15 miles inland as the crow flies, at a point where there is a little island in the middle of the river, which is called, not very imaginatively, Tiber Island. The shallows below this island afford the first easy crossing point over the Tiber when you're moving inland from the coast. Making this location even more attractive is that this river crossing is located along the Via Salaria, the Salt Road, so named because of the marshes near the mouth of the Tiber, which were a source of salt, an important early trade commodity. Thus, the ford below Tiber Island formed a natural communication node within Italy. A second feature of the river is that up to Tiber Island, it is navigable. This meant that the site of Rome would have good access to the sea and to maritime trade and communication. The next important geographic feature present at Rome, which made it an attractive site for settlement, 